Okay, so we are recording now. So um, I want to thank everyone for coming and our amazing speaker for coming and joining us today. For those of you uh, who don't know me, I am Killeen Molusky and I am the chair of ACRL New Mexico. We also have Monica and Jose with us, our other officers. Thank you so much, Monica and Jose for being here with us. And just so everybody knows as well, we do have an election coming up. So if you have not uh, submitted yourself or someone else that you think would be good for the positions, I will put that information in the chat uh, so you can take a look at that. So I want to go ahead and introduce our incredible speaker. Uh, today, Dr. John Sandstrom is the Acquisitions Librarian at New Mexico State University, and he'll be talking to us about Introduction to Consortia. In addition to his MLS, he has a Master of Public Administration and a Doctorate in Educational Leadership and Administration in higher ed. He has 35 years of experience working with consortia of various types. Outside the library, he's a reader, singer, weaver, spinner, and caregiver who hopes to get enough sleep really soon. <laughs> so thank you so much, John. I am gonna uh, pass it over to you. Uh, just so everyone knows, I'll have my camera off, but I will still be here monitoring. Okay, thank you very much, Colleen. And thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I really appreciate it. This is um, an area which is of growing interest for me since we are being encouraged to become, well, at least at New Mexico State University, in our goal to become more efficient, uh, we are being encouraged to take a more active part in various consortia and to join additional ones. So I'm glad to have a chance to talk about this introduction introducing what they are. I'm hoping at some point to be able to show this to the university administration and the regents so they can have an understanding of exactly what they're asking us to do. Um, come on, go, there we go. Uh, so what, what we're here for today, oh, and also one thing before I go on, Colleen, thank you for those adjectives. I don't think I've ever been called quite that level, and I do appreciate it. So what we're here for today, uh, we're going to talk about what is a consortium. And as you can see, my internet connection is unstable. If I freeze up, I'll be back in a few minutes, a few seconds, hopefully. So um, I'll talk about what exactly is a consortium. There seems to be some confusion about that at times. Um, look at the formal definitions of consortia and the types of consortia that are out there. Um, look at um, examples of library consortia, some of which we most of us may have heard of, others of which may be new. And, and then to look at some of the advantages of joining consortia and some of the disadvantages to joining consortia, and then a wrap up and some time for questions. Um, if you have questions during my presentation, please throw them into chat or raise your hand. I don't. I find it helpful that for those immediate questions to go ahead and try to answer them in the context where you have them. It's easier than keeping track of them until the end and remembering why you had the question. So, um, and I do like the interaction. I'm not here. I don't particularly like just being a lecturer. I like having the give and take between people. So, um, and uh, Killeen, thank you very much for, she has put the link to the um, nomination form for elections into the chat box. So thank you very much. Now that this is going to be redundant for most of the people who are here live, um, but this recording will be available and some of those folks may not know who I am. So who or what am I? <laughs> 
Um, I am a, a librarian, as Colleen said, I'm a librarian with 35 years experience, primarily in acquisitions and collection development. I have degrees in educational leadership, public management, and library science, which my mother has informed me makes me over degreed. Um, I have 34, 35 years of experience in academic, public, school, and special libraries. I also have a few years uh, working in the private sector for Baker and Taylor, which is a major book jobber, and for um, LSSI, or it's now Library Systems and Services, Inc., which is the library privatization firm. So I have a lot of experience in different parts of the um, industry. I'm the co-author of Fundamentals of Technical Services from ALA, published six years ago now, with Liz Miller when she was the head of cataloging at NMSU. I have lots of experience negotiating with vendors and consortia. It's a major part of my life. And I'm also a past president of NMLA. So um, that's kind of where I am grounding wise in libraries. Um, so that's um, why I think I can talk at least a little bit about what we're what we're here for today. Um, first thing, what is a consortium? Or that's the plural, the singular is consortium. Um, according to the Oxford Languages, an association typically of several businesses. Um, Merriam-Webster, an agreement or combination or group formed to undertake an enterprise beyond the resources of any one member. Um, this is one that there is actually a definition in US code about what a library consortium is. It's uh, any state, uh, local, statewide, regional, interstate, or international cooperative association of library entities, which provides for the systematic and effective coordination of the resources of school, public, academic, and special libraries and information centers for improved services for the clientele of such library entities. You got to hand it to the government. They are very good at verbiage. Um, basically, cutting through all of those words, a library consortium is a group of libraries that work together to improve services for their patron base through several different ways, which we'll be getting into. Consortium can be local. Um, an example of that would be something like the Houston Area Library Automation Network, Hallen, which was a consortia that handled library automation in the Houston area. It can be statewide, uh, NIMCAL, the New Mexico Consortium of Academic Libraries is an example of a statewide consortium here in New Mexico. Um, it can be uh, regional, such as the um, Amicos Consortia, which in, at the time it was founded, it was only for the Southwest its region has expanded quite a bit um, over the past few years. Uh, so it has actually grown to being an interstate uh, consortium. Uh, and then there's always international cooperative associations of library entities, which would be groups like um, BRLA, the Border Regional Library Association could be considered an international consortium, excuse me, an international consortia um, made up of Texas, 
New Mexico and um, Chihuahua. It's like it's Suarez, but I can't need the state name there. Um, which are all things that are examples of those levels of consortia. So by the definition of library consortium in the US code, El Paso um, Public Library is a consortium because it is made up of branches. The um, University of Texas system is a consortia because of the multiple membership around the state. So that term can be very flexible. And so when you're looking at working with them, we need, you have to be, you still have to define some of your terms. So that's kind of what a consort, that's what a consortium is. I hope it's not too confusing. Um, so more examples of library consortia uh, and a little bit more detail. Amigos, which uh, works with uh, continuing education, member discounts, and uh, consulting for um, their members, which are primarily in the Southwest, but have expanded quite a bit due to the breakup of the OCLC um regional system that they used to have uh the new mexico consortium of academic libraries nimcal which does resource sharing provides for scholarship and does some group uh, purchases uh, another one is the collaborative summer library reading program which is the public library program for um summer reading club and it's a consortia that puts together all of those wonderful bookmarks and handouts and certificates and themes and all of, they do all of that work once so all of the members of the collaborative can use that and can use those tools without having to redevelop them and then there's also the Connected Library Consortium, which is a multi-state shared digital collection of pre-K through 12 eBooks and audiobooks that is actually coordinated by the Mackin Company, which they're a major book jobber for school libraries. Um, and it's an example of one of the less common, well, I think they're less common types of library consortia, which is the ones that are actually put together and funded and managed by the, a vendor for their customers. Um, it, I find it very interesting that Mackin would put together a consortium that would allow their customers the ability to buy things cheaper. But it's kind of a nice thing for them to do. So what are some other examples of consortia that any of you can think of? Uh, Libros, this is uh, from Laura. Uh, as I recall, Libros is the automation consortia headed up by UNM, right? The one in Ohio was Ohio Link. Mm -hmm. And there was also um, Oplin was for the public libraries. Yeah. Um, OCLC is actually a consortium speaking of ohio metro in new york city 
Um, one that New Mexico State and our community colleges might be a little familiar with is the ELUNA um, consortia of um, ex libris libraries. So there are a lot of different types of, a lot of different consortia out there um, and a lot of different things that they do. Uh, another example of consortia is the um, West Consortia, which is a, uh, I've forgotten what West stands for, but it is a periodical um, print archive, shared print archive consortium. If you are a member, you will have access to the print volumes of the um, periodicals that are archived by them. But as a member, you are expected to archive needed titles that you have large runs of. Or you can decide not to do any archiving and pay more for your membership fees, which um, was the level of membership that NMSU had for a while. I believe we're still at that level. Um, there's West. So you know that's one that is that shared print archiving. In some ways, the State Library, UNM, and NMSU are a three-member consortia for the Government Documents Project that has been going on off and on for, gosh, I guess five or six years now, where each of us makes sure that we maintain our part of the federal GovDoc collection, but we don't have to keep hold of things that don't really that aren't really part of um, our regular need. Like NMSU is keeping everything from the Ag Department. The State Library is, I think, keeping Energy, Department of Energy. And UNM is keeping Health and Human Services and other ones. So we can all save on storage space and storage costs. Then there are uh, places like, um, oh, the one I'm most, most familiar with is the uh, York Library Consortia based out of Oneida, New York that is um, shared management of all of the libraries in their region. Oh, yes, there's, uh, Laura just put the link to the uh, shared government document li uh, live guide, NMFDLP. So um, if you have more curiosity about that, you can, follow that link. I also see that um, Jess has asked, is it basically like a co-op for libraries? They connect to help each other with resources and buying power. Good question. Co-ops are a type of consortia. In, you know, they have the same goals. They have, um, it's the groups of, of institutions banding together to share services, to share uh, resources, and to work together for the betterment of all the members. And you don't have to be a member Oh, yes. Yes, Jesse. Uh, Jess, 
working at a food co-op is actually a type of consortia, but co-op sounds much more user-friendly than a consortia does. Um, and I just derailed my train of thought. Oh, uh, one type of consortia that a lot of people overlook is the state library. It heads and um, organizes a statewide consortia of libraries just by their activity, you know, negotiating the statewide price agreements, um, providing that conduit between the state and the libraries, between the Department of Cultural services, cultural services department, um, the state library, the, the state department that's in charge of libraries, they help us work with them. That's a, another type of consortia. And they can all be working in different ways. And you aren't just a member of one usually. I counted up and um, if I remembered all of them, uh, NMSU is currently a member of about six different consortia because organizations like RAPID and um, I just lost the name, uh, Iliad, RAPID and Iliad are both consortia for interlibrary loan for resource sharing. So these are all different types uh, and examples of library consortia. So having talked about what they are and talked about some of the examples of them, why in the world would we want to be part of a consortia? Because there are some real advantages. Um, first, you can get better prices by buying joint access for a greater number of users. Um, NIMCAL is an example of a um, buying group. We get uh, better prices on all of our shared EBSCO databases um, buying as a group than we would buying them individually. At least that's the goal. It's not always true. That's why we have to, um, you have to look at consortia to make sure they are right for you. I'll get to that in, over to on the disadvantage side. Um, another advantage of consortia is that it will expand access to print and electronic collections and developing new services to meet your customers or patrons needs. This, um, an example of this, which is I think a really good one and it tends not to be really um, discussed a whole lot in the state as, that I'm aware of is the uh, passport service that allows all of, the, all of the libraries in the state who are part of it, which I believe is all of them, to uh, it allows for cross checkout of materials. So uh, through the passport program, you can go to almost any public library and check their books out. And that will work for some types of materials, not all of them, but for some types of materials at the um, university libraries also. Um, which is a, uh, a big help uh, today and honestly right now with the um, mind like sieve full of holes. Um, with COVID, with the pandemic, when we have more and more people working and studying remotely, being able to go to your local library where you may or may not have a card and use the card that you do have for where you're going to school to be able to 
use various materials and check things out is very helpful. So we may want to look at how that can be leveraged going, going forward to best serve our patrons. Because as I said, I don't hear about it very much. I have to be, the only time I really hear about it is when I'm on the State Libraries page and I see that that's one of their programs. <clears throat> um, consortia do allow you to do provide for each institution to be able to share resources without sacrificing the individuality of each member. And that is an important thing to remember because every library has their areas where they have invested more resources. They are a better, they have a deeper collection, a more diverse collection in certain areas. For universities, a lot of that will be seen in special collections and archives or in the areas that are fairly specialized to that institution, for example, AG for um, New Mexico State. And we don't want to lose that, indi that individuality, but we do want to maximize its usefulness to, every, to the state and the greater um, area. And we can do that through consortia and through resource sharing. So it, it's a very, very important piece of the uh, consortia equation. Another advantage that I personally really like is allowing for the central organization for professional development programs. Um, this is in part, you see that in Amigos. It is also, you know, New, um, ACRL New Mexico. This um, webinar is actually part of a consortia, not necessarily an institutional consortia. We're a consortia of the members of ACRL New Mexico and the New Mexico Library Association. Consortia do not have to be companies or institutions. They can be individuals if the, the consortial group is set up that way. And you will see that in some research activities where a group of researchers will go together to uh, work on a grant or um, buy a resource, a uh, re research resource that none of their libraries are able to get. Um, so there are some real advantages to consortia by having those broader um, possibilities, those broader opportunities is the word I'm looking for that come from being part of a consortia. Another real advantage that I see, which I did not include on the sheet, this is still kind of in development, is the networking opportunities. When you're part of a consortia, you have a built-in group that you can go to and say, hi, I have this issue. What, do you, what have you all done to fix it? or to address it. It's not necessarily a negative issue. Or, um, you know, a group that you can go and get input on various questions or concerns. That can be very, again, that can be very useful. So, you know, it's a, it's a starting place and there are, there are additional advantages. So, um, and those will change by each institution. For some institutions, the advantage of being a consortia is 
they'll have access to a whole lot of services that they wouldn't normally be able to have access to. Um, or like in the case of a lot of New Mexico libraries, okay, I'll admit it's outside academia for the most part, but not necessarily thinking of DACC and some of the community colleges, there are so few staff that you can't take off to go do a whole lot of professional training on your own or to develop professional training for your whole staff. So being part of a consortia that does that is very, very helpful and can be the only way to really have a robust professional development program for your library. I have worked for places that had a full-time person who did nothing but, cut, but professional development. They designed the programs, they found the teachers, they, they did all of that. Um, I don't know very many organizations that can really afford that. And even at NMSU where we have the teaching academy that handles professional development, we don't have a big library presence in that organization to do ours because ours is very fairly narrow so um you know again the advantages of being part of the consortia however wherever you find advantages you will also find disadvantages so there are some real disadvantages. One of them is uh, membership cost and the return on investment. Most membership costs, well, most consortia, if they're all very large, um, have a lot of costs. You have to hire staff to provide the services that the consortia are providing. You have to hire people to do the training. Um, if you have enough people, you may need to find, uh, rent an office or rent space in one of your member libraries if that space is available. And all of these are paid through membership costs and the costs of services. And you have to watch them to make sure that the cost of belonging is not greater than the cost of not belonging, which gets us into return on investment. Um, and you have to, return on investment is not the easiest thing to always uh, understand or to be able to develop, but for example, in the terms of NIMCAL, it is actually costing some members of NIMCAL more to get their EBSCO materials through NIMCAL than it is to get them independently. That the share of the geo bond money that gets taken off the top to pay for that, their share is greater than what they would have to pay EBSCO for those same resources. Um, that makes it very difficult to justify them staying in without other outside factors, which there are. Um, and sometimes that, that's just the financial side of membership costs. There can also be a, a participation cost. You know, you may have to devote some of your staff to things that will um, to service at the consortial level. Um, examples of that are um, I I asked for permission to run for the board of Amigos. They had asked me to. I was told that I couldn't do that right now because I had enough on my plate as it was. Um, and it was not my supervisor who told me that. 
it's so you know you've got you may lose people to serve on the board to serve on various committees i'm part of the resource sharing committee for nimcal that eats some time um, So, um, and then there may be some travel costs involved. If you're in a consortium, consortium, consortia that meets physically before the pandemic, maybe soon, you may have to um, pull together for and have some costs there. So you have to look at those at those costs of membership. Uh, with the West Consortia. Um, print archiving your cost for full membership is to provide the print archive to one or more periodicals which means you're devoting the space and the staff to maintain a physical collection and that can also get very expensive uh, when I worked at Houston Public Library, they did a, they, the accountant, the head of the business office worked out that to have a book sitting on the shelf for a year costs $12.95. Then if you multiply that by all the books you had, or they had at that time that did not circulate, it came out to a really high number. And that was just the cost to have a book sitting on the shelf. You have to look at the, especially in terms of print archiving, you have to look at those costs and how that plays into your return on investment. A second um, disadvantage of consortia is institutional inertia. Places don't want to join them or don't want to use them, use consortia effectively because, well, we've always done it this way and we don't see any point in changing, even when there may be a point to changing. Um, some consortia do require that you give up some of your independence, that you work together as a group. That's part of what a consortia is. And there are some institutions that have a lot of problems with that loss of independence. Um, another issue is the lack of standards or the inability to enforce standards. Uh, this can especially hit when it's a uh, cataloging type uh, consortia where you have a centralized cataloging department for several institutions. If they all are not holding to the same standard, it can get very, very expensive and very, very confusing. So that lack or of standards or the lack of enforceability can be a very big disadvantage. Although the reverse can be can also be true when joining a consortia, they want you to um, change what you've already done to meet their, their standard. Uh, Monica is asking, in regard to consortia sponsoring professional development, do you know who decides what is to be offered? Um, in my experience, uh, they tend to come to the membership or to people who are attending the professional development uh, programs and say, what else would you like us to um, provide? You can also, if you go to their website, like if you go to the Amigos website, there is a place under their professional development tab where you can suggest a program. They will, uh, they, do, they also maintain a uh, directory of consultants and that gives them the pool of people they need to draw on to perform the training if it's something they can't do in-house. So did that answer your question, Monica? Okay. Um, another place, another disadvantage with consortia is that there can be cons confusion regarding boundaries. 
what part of the process are you responsible for? What part is a consortia responsible for? Who decides that, where that line is? It can get very confusing if that line is in different places with different libraries, or if the library wants to move that boundary for whatever reason. Um, another disadvantage is the work that it takes to integrate consortia into re your regular business practices. In many cases, um, consortia are sponsored by an institution as NIMCAL, had, well, sponsored, or they have a, a, a member institution who is their fiscal agent, like NIMCAL fiscal agent for quite a while. Thank you, Colleen. For quite a while was uh, Eastern New Mexico. The last I heard they were moving that to UNM, but I'm not sure. Um, this can cause confusion in how to integrate them into business practices. Also membership fees, where do they come from? Do they come from collections? Do they come from operating budget? How to budget these types of things can also be very confusing. And I'm sure there are other disadvantages. Um, although I, I'll admit I am a supporter of moving to consortia. So I tend to like to focus on the advantages. And we are at 245. So do we have any questions? And if you all want to unmute your microphones and talk, that is fine with me. Just raise your hand so I can call on you. In fact, well, I'm not going to quit sharing it because my contact information is there if any of you want one would be interested in it. But I can pull the participants box up so I can see if people have raised their hand. Um, I know that the... Um, Legislative Financial Committee has been asking about a consortium membership as a way to save money at the university level. So it is something that's kind of cutting edge right now. Yes, Monica, what can I do for you? Uh, I just wanted to ask you if, um, if there are any consortia that you would like NMSU or other um, or UNM to join and why the ones that we are we do not belong to just yet right now for myself i'm not as interested in joining new consortia as i am in making better use of the ones we're already a member of now i'm not sure what consortia or which consortiums uh, UNM is a member of, but I do think that we are underutilizing a couple of our memberships, including Amigos, and I would personally would really like to work on making NIMCAL into a much stronger, um, flexible and diverse um, consort statewide consortium that can really be a representative of the academic libraries in the state of New Mexico. Right now, most of what it does is spend geo bond money and give a uh, give us a couple of scholarships every year and provide a place for academic librarians who need service to get some service in, some statewide service in. These are all good things, don't get me wrong. But if we could pull together to write, uh, to do some common contracts with more than just EBSCO, we could probably have some better um, discounts and better some better service with uh, other common vendors. Okay. So, but that's a really good question. Thank you.
are there are um, there are general and specialized consortia. Most of what I mentioned here are fair. Well, no, this is a good mix of general and specialized because West is very specialized. They are they do print archiving. That's it. Um, where Amigos is a fairly general um, consortia. NIMCAL is focused while the state library version of a consortia is very general because they're serving all the libraries in the state. So um, other questions, comments? If you have some complaints, please contact me directly. Um, Colleen, a last p uh, one thing that I forgot to ask beforehand was, is there going to be an evaluation for this webinar sent out? We did not have an evaluation that we've created, partially because um, we're really trying to get this off the ground and just didn't want any barriers to, to people feeling comfortable. However, if you okay. have an evaluation that you would like us to send out, we can do so, John. Okay, yeah, I'll probably do that. This is the first time that I've given this pre presentation and just giving it, I found some holes that I needed to address. So, um, but I, I'd like everyone who's here to uh, to do that, that evaluation to let me know what I need to do better. Um, one thing that I realized that I just realized that I'd left out was the how consortium are organized. There are two or three basic ways that they're organized. Probably the most common is like Amigos, where all of the members dues go to forming a new company, which in this case was Amigos. The members are all on the board and their membership fees pay for those basic costs. Another type like NIMCAL, there is not really a separate office. Everyone pitches in to do some part of it, of what needs to be done. And then they have a fiscal agent, uh, which as I mentioned, used to be Eastern New Mexico and I believe was moving to UNM, although with all the retirements in the last couple of years, I'm not sure if that's still true. Um, so that can be, that's a, a second type. There's the ones that are, that are sponsored by vendors, uh, which means they foot most of the bill for them and your membership is, is buying their product or rent or subscribing to their product. Um, these, are, uh, these are all different types of consortia and how they are organized. And a lot of it is based on size, but it can also be based on, um, you know, what geographic region are you covering? Who in the, who, if it's a limited region, who in your membership has the resources available to actually pay for the resources needed to run the consortium? I was part of the White Pine library consortium in Michigan when I lived up there. And Saginaw Valley State University covered all of the administrative costs with our staff and with um, our funds. And the membership was you had to buy into uh, our the shared automation system. Theirs was a Carl system, if, you, if you're old enough to remember Carl. And um, they also had an additional fee on top of that to be on a, uh, we provided a delivery service for interlibrary loan materials between member libraries. So it's, there are several different ways that they can be set up. 
Okay, Therese, thank you for being here and we will talk to you all later. Talk to you later, bye-bye. And um, so that is basically all I have. If there are no more questions, my contact information is there on the screen right now. You can always email me or call me. That phone number is currently forwarded to my cell phone, so I will get it whether I'm in the office or not. And um, I will be glad to answer any questions or, um, and I really hope that if you feel like I completely went wrong on something, you'll let me know because that's how I get better. And that's how I improve my presentations. Also at the fall conference, I'll be doing an all day uh, pre-conference on weeding, everyone's favorite subject. So um, if you've been to my uh, weeding programs in the past, it's going to be, uh, the morning will be weeding 101, uh, weeding based on condition. And the afternoon will be weeding 102 or 201, I've forgotten which number I used, which will be um, weeding beyond condition as well as planning uh, weeding pro large weeding projects. So I hope to see at least some of you there. I, I just wanted to say thank you, John. I didn't even know what a, a what is it, a consortia was. So oh. I learned a lot today. <laughs> Good, I'm glad to hear it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I've heard the word, but I, I was like, I don't know what that means. So now I know. And um, Jose, Colleen, and Monica, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And